this um, holiday season, there are a lot of folks who are more open to the gospel and th- to Christ and the church uh, at this time of the year than any time. So just be alert what God's doing around you. Uh, he may be drawing somebody and he may want to use you. So certainly be alert. And uh, also, I want to thank you as your pastor for all your generosity during the year. But particularly uh, at this time, a lot of folks give extra giving. And that helps fund ministries of all kinds throughout the year. Children's ministries and student ministries and adult ministries, worship services like this. Everything we're doing outside the walls. Thank you for your generous giving here at, here at Wood's Edge. So we're going to uh, stand, if you would, and we're going to read the passage in Luke 1, our passage today. Luke 1, I'll begin in verse 26 and go through the passage. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth, to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. And the virgin's name was Mary. And he came to her and said, Greetings, O favored one. The Lord is with you. But she was greatly troubled at the saying and tried to discern what sort of greeting this might be. And the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. He will be great. And will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom there will be no end. And Mary said to the angel, How will this be since I am a virgin? And the angel answered her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be called holy, the Son of God. And behold, your relative Elizabeth, in her old age, has also conceived a son, and this is the sixth month with her who was called barren, for nothing will be impossible with God. And Mary said, Behold, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. Church, this is God's holy word. Please be seated. When the infinite and sovereign God, the God of all eternity, comes to earth, he comes to the womb of a young Jewish teenager. He chooses an unknown, undistinguished Jewish peasant girl living in a small obscure town on the eastern fringes of the Roman Empire in the backwater country of Israel. And that is just like God, isn't it? That he would use ordinary people because all through Scripture we see that God uses ordinary people. In fact, in the book that we're going through, Luke's second book, the book of Acts, in Acts 4.13, we read just a few weeks ago. Now, when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated, ordinary men, they were astonished. And they recognized that they had been with Jesus. Now, just another reminder we see in Scripture is that God uses weak people, flawed people, ordinary people, people like you and me. And so we cannot see uh, God just using the uh, spiritual elite or the specially gifted or the specially educated, because if, if that's how we see God, we don't see him right. He is the God who delights to use the weak, the broken, the flawed, the ordinary. And we see it classically here with this young, obscure Jewish teenager. And so in verse 27, this powerful angel, Gabriel, appears... We read, to a virgin betrothed to a man. Now, betrothed, uh, we know it means something between our engagement and our marriage. It was kind of like a legal engagement. Took a certificate of divorce to, to sever it, but they were betrothed. 
betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. And he's telling us, he's giving us a hint here, okay, Joseph, the official father of the family, not the biological father, but the official father, Joseph, is of the line of David, King David. So he's in the royal line, and, and he'll pick up on that very strongly in a few moments. And the virgin's name was Mary. So a hint of kingship already. Now in verse 28, Gabriel begins speaking. He says to Mary, this young girl, Greetings, O favored one, the Lord is with you. Now, this is a challenging passage because we are so familiar with it. And we just kind of know it. We know what's going to happen. But remember that all of this was new to Mary. She had never read Luke 1, has she? She never read the Christmas story. So she is there, and this powerful angel appears, and, and this is just going to just be staggering things that he says. Imagine what this young teenager would be feeling and thinking at this time. Greetings, I mean this angel, greetings, O oh, favored one, the Lord is with you. Now, two basic truths there. She is favored. She is favored by God. There is an everyday word Behind that, that's just about always translated in the New Testament as the word grace. It's the same word. In fact, you, you may know that grace is, is unmerited favor. It's, it's the favor of God that we don't deserve. It's God's love and mercy poured out on folks who don't deserve it. And, and that's the everyday word. And so he's saying, uh, greetings, the one who is graced by God. Now, think about it. Uh, that is true for you, isn't it? If, if you're in Christ, you are the recipient of, of his lavish grace and mercy. In fact, Ephesians 1.6 says it this way, when it says, To the praise of his glorious grace with which he has blessed us in the beloved in Christ. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight. And so... The, the Bible is very emphatic that if you're in Christ, you, you have been the recipient of lavish grace. Lavish grace. And we've got to see ourselves that way. And the second thing he says to Mary is, the, the greetings, favored one, graced one, the Lord is with you. He's with you. Now, now, that also is true of every one of us, isn't it? All through the Bible, we see this grand promise of God that I will be with you always. Maybe most notably, at the end of Matthew's gospel, the Great Commission, and, and I will be with you always to the end of the age. I will be with you. And so these are two truths, not just true of Mary, but in a special sense of Mary, but, but true for every single one of us. And we cling to them. We cling to them. I am the recipient of God's lavish grace. God is always going to be with me. And, and we, we, we got to keep those truths before us. Now, in verse 29, we see that Mary... Uh, like we see throughout the Bible with a response to an angel, but she was greatly troubled at the saying and tried to discern what sort of greeting this might be. She's trying to process this, figure this out. She'd never heard it before. And the angel in verse 30 said to her, do not be afraid, Mary, which tells us she was scared to death. Do, do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And he's repeating, You're, you got the favor of God. You got the grace of God, the everyday word for grace here. Now, all through the Bible, as you know, as we saw last week with Zechariah, uh, God's invariable response to our fear is, do not be afraid. You don't have to be afraid. And uh, for us, we all wrestle with fear. That's part of our humanness. In fact, it's been said that, that fear is the governing emotion of human beings. It, it can be so strong and powerful and debilitating, sucking all the life out of us. And so God repeatedly says to us, and, and if you walked in this here this morning with some fear that you're currently wrestling with, many of us did, um, God's word to you is this morning, it's God's word to Mary, do not be afraid, I am with you, I am with you. You're the object of my faith, my favor, and my love. So God, Gabriel goes on, he begins to explain for the first time, that was the greeting, but now he's going to explain about this child that's going to be coming. In verse 31, And behold, you will conceive in your womb 
and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. Now, again, totally new to Mary. She understands that he's not talking about a son to be born after she eventually marries Joseph. She understands this is going to be a special birth before she sleeps with Joseph after the marriage. Betrothal, they did not have any sex. And so uh, she understands this. That becomes clear. She's not married. Uh, that culture, unlike our culture, uh, uh, the Jewish couple that was headed towards marriage certainly did not sleep together. If she got pregnant, that would be just abhorrent. She would lose all of her friends and, and be the, the, the gossip of the town. It would be a scandal. It would be horrible. And she's processing this. Okay, I'm going to get pregnant and before, and, and, and people are not going to understand. What am I going to say to my parents? What am I going to say to Joseph? Oh, yeah, an angel appeared to me. And, and you know, she's probably thinking about all this is going to mean to her, the cost of being pregnant out of wedlock. You will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you should call his name Jesus. <clears throat> We need to understand the word Jesus, especially at the birth of Jesus, because both Matthew's birth narrative and Luke's narrative make an issue of this name. Now, the name Jesus in the New Testament would be the, the Old Testament equivalent would be Joshua. I imagine we have some Joshua's here in the room today. You've got the Old Testament equivalent of the name Jesus. Now, the, the really a better way for spelling of that would, would be Yeshua. Uh, Hebrew didn't have a J, it'd be a uh, Y, as in Jerusalem. So Yeshua would be how we'd say that. Or how they would spell it would be Y apostrophe Shua, and the Y would be an abbreviation for Yahweh, and Shua is the Hebrew word for to save. So that name means, Joshua, Yeshua, Jesus means Yahweh saves. But the Hebrews w uh, wouldn't... Uh, be pronouncing God's name like that. So it's Yeshua is how it's abbreviated. And it had a meaning, Yahweh, God, saves. That's what the term Jesus means. It means God saves. And, and of course, the fullest meaning is going to be that he came to save as God. And later in Luke's gospel, this same gospel, Luke 19.10, Jesus summarizes his whole mission for coming. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save that which is lost. He came to save us from our sin. So the whole point of Christmas is Savior. He came to save us from our sin. Now he continues when he says, Gabriel is explaining to Mary this is about it, and he says of this child, he will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. Now you folks who have read the Bible for years and years uh, one thing to be alert to as you're reading the Bible is that the Bible has some incredible understatements. And, and for, for him to say, you know, Jesus is going to be great, uh, that, that is the most incredible understatement. But, uh, but it's just like the Bible. I appreciate John Piper commenting on this passage. He says, a Christian who feels ashamed of Jesus Christ is like a candle that is ashamed of the sun. Our Lord Jesus has been appointed the heir of all things. Through him, God created the world. He reflects the glory of God and bears the very stamp of his nature, upholding the universe with the word of his power. Is there anything great in the world that excites you, that you go out of your way to see or hear? Christ made it. And he is 10 million times greater in every respect except sin. If you took all the greatest thinkers of every country and every century of the world and put them in a room with Jesus, they would shut their mouths and listen to the greatness of his wisdom. All the greatest generals would listen to his strategy. All the greatest musicians would listen to his music theory and his performance in every instrument. There is nothing that Jesus cannot do a thousand times better than the person you admire most in any area of human endeavor under the sun, including LeBron James. He didn't say that. <laughs> Words fail to feel the greatness of Jesus. So Gabriel leaves it simple and yet so profound. He will be great. What an understatement. And for you and me to be ever ashamed of Christ is like a candle being ashamed of the sun. How ridiculous is that? He will be great. 
and he will be called the Son of the Most High. Most High, that's God. He's the Son of God, the Most High God, the Savior of the world, the coming King. Now, Gabriel is saying incredible things, but he's not done yet. 32, he emphasizes the kingship that I alluded to earlier. And the Lord God will give to him, this baby, the throne of his father, David. That would be King David. He will reign over the house of Jacob forever for all time's sake in the coming, in the future. He's not a normal king. And of his kingdom, there will be no end. There will be no limit to it. He's the king of kings. He is the king. The great king, the only true king. He will be great. And he will be the king. Now put yourselves in Mary's shoes. All of this is new to her. She had not read this. And and she's hearing all of this incredible things. And so she not unnaturally asked Gabriel a question in verse 34. How will this be since I am a virgin? Now, Now let me be clear here. If you were with us last week with Zechariah, Zechariah had a question, but it was asked in a very different way. His question was asked out of unbelief and doubt. He he was basically saying to Gabriel, look, even though you're an angel and you came in the presence of God and and you're telling me that that we in our old age and barrenness are going to have a baby, I don't believe it. Show me a sign. And, And remember the judgment on that, the repercussion on that was he couldn't talk until the baby was born. Now, this is very different. Mary is not questioning it. She believes it's going to happen. But she just wonders, you know, okay, I'm not sleeping with Joseph. I'm not, I'm a virgin. How is this going to happen? It was more for clarification than than any unbelief. And it's a very different response from, for for, for Gabriel uh, to this question. How will it be? How's that going to work? Gabriel responds, I think this is the greatest verse in the passage. He responds, the Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. It's going to be a divine child. There's going to be no sex involved, but the Spirit of the living God will overshadow you. Maybe that was later that night. Maybe it was the next morning. Within days, I take it it was soon. The Holy Spirit overshadows her, falls upon her, impregnates this Jewish teenager with God. Now, God, man? You mean the God of eternity, the eternal Son of God, comes not just a baby needing a diaper change, but a zygote in the, in the womb of a teenager? The staggering truth of the incarnation and of Christmas. Oh, the glitter and the glitz of Christmas should not be the focus, but Christ alone. The baby who is king, who is God, who is Yeshua, Yahweh, saves. And he did it by a cross. And the blood was shed to save us from ourselves. He will be holy, 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 holy is the Lord God of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. That's the one. He'll be the the son of God. I know the term son of God could be used of humans and angels at times, but he is the son of God, God the son. And wonder of wonders, the Holy Spirit will overshadow this teenager and she'll give birth to a son. Now, maybe Gabriel needs to sort of encourage her that, okay, remember, God's a miracle-working God. So he points out in verse 36, and behold, your relative Elizabeth in her old age has conceived a son, and in this, and this is the sixth month with her who was called barren. So Elizabeth, probably in her 60s, at least 50s, been barren all of her life. Uh, she's Mary's cousin. Mary will go to her next passage, and the angel Gabriel is telling her, she's pregnant. Go check it out. And she does. Um, she's pregnant. So, you know, God can do it. God can do it. And this is even a greater miracle. And so he encourages her further in verse 37, a great verse for us to hang on to. For nothing will be impossible with God. Mary, 
Uh, this is all going to happen. Elizabeth is even pregnant. For nothing is impossible with God. Now, we see this uh, a good bit throughout Scripture. I regularly remind you of the truth of Genesis 18, 14. Is anything too hard for the Lord? Is anything too hard for God? And, and we've got to keep that in mind because we got some God-sized things in, going on in our lives, don't we? we? We need God to break through and do the, the God-sized. Back in September 1, through October 10th, we had the 40-day prayer challenge. Most of you were around then, and we had these prayer journals. And I ask you to write in here three God-sized prayer requests. We had a number of them answered. But many of us, including me, uh, ours have not been answered yet. And so we keep praying for them. Now, we've got three notebooks. They started off being in kind of a random order. Now they're alphabetized, so you can find your name. And, and when you get an answer to it, you put one of these red things that means, yes, answered. Uh, if you haven't put one in that, I, I encourage you, we got paper up here, and you, and you can enter one. But these are God-sized prayer requests that we are trusting God for things that only God could do. And, and that pleases God, because all through the Bible, God reminded us, I can do it. I can do it. Nothing is too big for me. You can't even think or imagine of something. I can do greater. I can do greater. And it glorifies the Lord. Nothing would be impossible with God. And then the final verse, he concludes, verse 38. Uh, or, or she responds to this by saying, Behold, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed for her, from her. Now keep in mind, Mary is going to get pregnant, not married. The gossip will start. The gossip will run wild. Joseph will choose to divorce her, and he would have divorced her if God wouldn't have sent Gabriel back to let him know what's up. Um, huge humiliation. The rest of her life, probably. And, and yet, so, so she's aware of this, and yet, what, how does she respond? Lord, if that's your ask for me, the answer is yes. The answer is yes. I, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. That is a prayer of surrender. And that is a prayer of trust. That I don't understand, Lord God, how this is going to happen or, or how you're going to take care of all this, but it, 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 I'm trusting you. It, it is a prayer of obedience. God, this was God's call for her, and, and uh, she says, yes, yes. Now, church, we, this is great, Mary's greatness right here. That, that's why she is so admired and esteemed is because, you know, God is looking for worshipers who don't just give lip service to God's Word, but they obey. And they obey because they believe that God is God. And, and He's the King. And, and so I bow my knees to Him and obey Him. And, and, and even today, right here at Wood's Edge, God is looking for men and women who will bow the knee, bend the knee, who will say yes. Now, now, let me just be a little specific here. When I, when I think about the church in America today and some of the, the common areas of disobedience, um, I mean, God is looking for people who will obey Him. And, and so, what about forgiveness? That, the, the person who's wronged you, that we forgive them and let it go. Now, I consider that probably the hardest thing in the Christian life, and we all wrestle with it. Some of you may be more than others, but, but all of us have to do battle with this one. And yet, um, God forgives us for a, a billion, billion dollars worth of sin, and, and yet we need to forgive that $100 sin or even the million dollar sin. In fact, every Sunday morning we pray, don't we? Lord, Father, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. When you forgive... As hard as it is, you are saying, yes, God. Yes, God, I surrender this to you. Doesn't mean you, you don't feel pain. It, it doesn't mean it's not hard. It certainly doesn't mean you forget it. If it's big, you don't forget it. But it means you choose to give it to God. It is a step of surrender and obedience and trust. God, you got it. Or what about sexual sin? We live in a sex-crazed society, which completely 
ignores uh, God's, uh, the holiness of sex in marriage, and there's internet pornography everywhere, and so often we see that uh, people in the church are just like folks outside the church, and it must not be if, if we are worshipers. Not, not just in our lips, the lip service, but if we're willing to obey the Lord and trust the Lord, that's out. Or what about money? Um, I mean, you want me to give Lord the top 10% at least? I mean, that's just the starting point. Uh, and trust you that we can pay the bills and we'll have enough? Um, are we going to give lip service? Are we going to obey the Lord? Um, there's more. We're, I'm getting awfully personal here, but uh, we could talk about gossip. We could talk about, you know, praying. We could talk about uh, anger. We could talk about loving your spouse the way God calls us to with respect and gentleness and tenderness. Um, God is looking for people who will obey him just like Mary did. I am your servant. Let it be to me according to you. So church, this magnificent passage is really ultimately about this baby to be born of the Holy Spirit and this teenager, and he will be Yeshua, Yahweh saves us from our sin. And it is the greatest news ever, and he will be great beyond all comprehension. And church, this Christmas season, my deep desire for us as a people is that we would not be caught up in all the franticness and the busyness of the season, but, but that we would be Jesus intoxicated and Jesus focused. What, what if the next 10 days, that every morning you're, you're waking up and just reminding yourself uh, of what God did at Christmas? Because ultimately, everything that you long for is found in Christ, and there is nothing that you truly want that is going to be found apart from Christ. Don't be lied to by the, by, by the lies of this world or, or your, your enemy. What you ultimately want is found in this baby who is your king. Now, there were some very practical things in addition to this main point. You saw them. I pointed them out. Uh, things like God uses ordinary people like you and me. So it just doesn't do to, to say, I, I'm not ready. I can't do that. God loves to use broken, flawed, ordinary people. Secondly, God's word to Mary is God's word to you. Do not be afraid. You are highly favored. I will be with you. I am always with you. Or the teaching that nothing is impossible with God. God is a miracle working God. Nothing is too hard for God. He can do it. He can do it. And then finally, that truth at the very, at the very end in 38, that, that he is our king and we bend the knee to him and we obey him. Church, let's do this. Would you close your eyes? And would you ask God, Lord, what are you saying to me this morning? What, what do I need to hear from you? Take the response of Mary in verse 38. Lord, block out every voice except your voice. Obey him. You can trust him. No secret sin. Full surrender. If you're here in the room, you never trusted Christ, receive the Savior, do it now. Do it now. Say yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Lord, we love you and we bless you and we thank you for a Savior. Thank you so much for a Savior. May we be Christ focused this Christmas season and every day. In Christ's name.